Hello and welcome to Compass Group Full Year Results Conference Call. Hosting today's call will be Dominic Blakemore, Group Chief Executive Officer. Please note this conference is being recorded and for the duration of the call, your lines will be on listen only. However, you will have the opportunity to ask questions at the end of the call. This can be done by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad to register your question. If you require assistance at any point, please press star 0 and you will be connected to an operator. I will now hand you over to your host, Dominic Blakemore, to begin today's conference. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for dialing in. You've seen today's results and heard our presentation. We're really, really pleased with what was achieved in 2021 and just as excited by the prospects for 22. In particular, reinstating the dividend was a key staging post in our confidence in recovery. Though what I think is most important is that in my 10 years in the business, I've never seen more opportunity and we've never been stronger or better placed in such an exciting market. What do I mean by that? The pipeline is exceptional. We've reported record wins in all regions. We're converting more first-time outsourcing than ever. We're seeing very strong recoveries and positive momentum in our sectors. We've got the digital and climate offers to win. We've the balance sheet to exploit all of these opportunities. And we're the partner of choice for businesses wishing to sell or scale. That all points us to fully restoring our pre-COVID size and shape and growing faster than ever before. As we know, there are short-term challenges, but we have the experience, scale, and means to deal with them. And when I step back to take a longer-term view, these are tailwinds that will ultimately create more growth opportunity. I truly believe the actions we've taken over the past 18 months have set us up for a period of strong performance in the years ahead. I'm joined by Palmer Brown, our new a permanent CFO this morning. Now let's open the call to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you would like to ask a question or make a contribution on today's call, please press star 1 on your telephone keypads now, please. Please ensure your line is unmuted locally, and then you will be introduced into the call. That is star 1 on your telephone keypads now, please. Okay, our first question comes from Bilal Aziz from UBS. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, two from my side, please. Um, firstly, um, just on the rate of new business wins, and you've clearly grown that by 15% this year. Perhaps what do you think a sustainable win rate is going forward now? One of your competitors was suggesting some normalization of that first-time outsourcing trend, but Dominic, it felt that you were perhaps a bit more optimistic on the presentation. And then number two, just on the revenue guidance, I appreciate the uncertainty. Um, the low end still implies a small sequential improvement. Perhaps can you flesh out your expectation by vertical and any comments what you may have seen in October, November to get an idea of the pace of the improvement going forward? Thank you. Yes, yeah, thanks, Bilal. Why don't I, I'll take the second question first and then ask Palmer to speak to the rate of, of new business wins. So in terms of that revenue guidance of 20 to 25 percent, that, that broadly means uh, achieving 90 to 95 percent of, of 2019 revenues on a full year basis uh, with an expectation of exiting uh, at or around the 100 percent level uh, by the fourth quarter. Um, in terms of what we're seeing by, by sector, um, you know, it, it, let me start with the stronger sectors first, and, and perhaps it's probably worth just uh, illustrating what we're seeing in terms of volume trend, but also in terms of what we're seeing in first-time outsourcing trend, and that might go some way to, to answering your first question too. So if we start with the more de defensive sectors, you know, our healthcare sector has performed consistently above 2019 levels. I think it's worth pointing out a couple of things though. Let's remember that our retail business, which is around 10% of that portfolio, is still some way from recovery. So we would expect to see that come back in due course. Separately, it's very clear that there are waiting lists for uh, clinical treatments all around the world. And as we talk to our clients in that sector today, we do expect longer hours, um, additional days, and potentially more shifts. And, and therefore, uh, over time, and particularly once we're through the tricky next few months, we would expect to see higher volumes in that sector. And then finally, we've continued to win new business strongly, um, and particularly in the senior, senior living space. 
So we, we in, in, in the beginnings of the new financial year, we've seen um, the, the biggest single uh, first time outsourcing uh, within the senior living space. And, and often when we see these things happen, like we did with Ascension and Texas A&M, respectively in the, uh, the healthcare and uh, education spaces, they tend to put more pressure uh, on the opening up of first time outsourcing. So we're really, really pleased with, with that. Um, if we move next to Defence Offshore Remote, again, consistently performed above 2019 levels. Um, again, we, we've continued to take share in that sector through the pandemic. I think looking forward, a, a couple of points, again, you know, the retail levels on site are not back where they were. We would expect those to continue to recover. Um, secondly, we, we do expect there to be significant demand for oil, gas and commodities uh, as we witness global economic recovery. And so we are expecting to see higher volumes within that sector again over time. And then lastly, there continues to be opportunities for new contract wins. And, and as we see the emergence of hydro, wind farms and so forth, there's, there's new subsectors and opportunity opening up within that market. Um, thinking now about the sort of three sectors that were a little bit more impacted, um, let's start with, with education. We've seen a very strong recovery in education. Um, again, that may slow a little as we go through the next few months in the Northern Hemisphere winter, uh, but broadly we've seen a strong return. I think we've, we've got less concerns today about virtual learning, particularly within the higher ed space. It's very clear that both academics and students um, are keen on the, the campus experience. Um, and in particular, we're seeing where students have returned. They are spending more, participating more and, and more social than, than ever. So I think those are all positives in that sector. And of course, you know, again, learnings of the pandemic have been around uh, the provision of food in the lower ed space um, and nutritional quality. And so lots of opportunity, we believe, for investment from, from government there. Um, and in the higher ed space, of course, we see institutions that are looking to sort of work their assets more, and therefore we expect roles to be strong. Um, in sports and leisure, you, you've seen a very strong fourth quarter recovery up to 90-odd uh, percent of 2019. But at the moment, you've got to remember, not everywhere is yet open. Conference centres aren't open. Um, we're not yet seeing uh, artists, international artists touring globally. Um, uh, and therefore, you know, there are lesser events still at the moment. So we do expect all of those to recover. Uh, again, as events go indoors, it may slow a touch over the coming months, but we expect it to be strong beyond the sort of spring and summer of next year. And, and what we're also witnessing in that sector is, um, is strong per capita spend. So whilst participation is probably 10% down, we're seeing anywhere between 20 and 30% higher levels of spend, uh, which is more than compensating. And then, and then finally, in, in BNI, um, I think we have to remember we need to split that sector into manufacturing and offices. In the manufacturing part of our business, which is half of that 40% of our portfolio, um, you know, we have continued to see people going into the workplace for obvious reasons. And because of the kind of quite strict COVID protocols that operate, um, you know, we have seen people participating strongly uh, and the need for our services uh, is as great as ever. Um, slightly different picture in, in the office space, and we've talked about that today. Uh, a slower return, particularly in large urban areas, probably around 50% on the average around our world. Uh, lower in some countries, higher in others. Um, we're obviously seeing a different pattern of days, which we've talked about. But again, we're seeing uh, individuals spend longer in the office, higher participation, higher spend rates, clients willing to offer free food programs as, uh, as an attraction to the return to office and working with us on providing sort of compelling offers to bring them back in. Um, so I think we do believe that once we get beyond, again, the spring, we would expect to see a degree more normalization in that sector, maybe a bit trickier through the winter months, as I think we'll all be, we'll all be cautious, won't we? Um, but as I talk to a, a few CEOs and, and our clients, you know, clearly the mood has moved from we can work virtually to we want to work on a hybrid basis to, you know, we're now concerned about our culture, our productivity, the training of our of our colleagues and, and all around well-being. And there's definitely a sort of keenness to get back to more presence than, the, than there is today. So I'm optimistic about what that could look like once we get through the, these winter months. And I, and I should say as well, both within sports and leisure and BNI, whilst highly outsourced sectors, we are still seeing first-time opportunities uh, because of all these pressures we, we, we've described. Um, so I think momentum is positive. You've seen today us talk about 
you know, 20% of our 2019 volume sort of still potentially to come back, as well as that net new business opportunity, which is what, what gives us the, the optimism. And over to Palmer for the net new win rate. I think this part of the question really hits to, you know, one of the themes and one of the things we're most excited about in the business now and in looking ahead. I mean, Dominic talked about the, the opportunity for the, the, the recovery in the base business. But one of the other things that's uh, quite exciting when it comes to the, the growth trajectory is the, the new business opportunity. When you look at the, the billion pounds of um, net new business that we, we mobilized in the year, that's on an annualized basis. The 2.1 billion of new business wins, um, the record uh, retention rate that we established, um, that, that, that all has us feeling quite excited. But I, but I think when you drill down a bit, I think it really speaks to the ongoing opportunity. 50% of those new business wins came from first-time outsourcing. We think that the market dynamics are ripe for that to continue. So when you think about the um, macroeconomic challenges, the things that make things quite difficult for our operators on a daily basis, things like supply chain disruption, labor shortages, uh, inflation, um, those are things that can be a catalyst for outsourcing. And even if you look at those items and you think they may be temporary, there are other challenging and complexities um, that are coming online that, that, that are catalysts as well. So when you look at increased regulation, um, changing consumer sentiment, heightened expectations when it comes to digital and technology, those are the kind of things that really play to our favor and have us feeling quite comfortable about um, you know, how we feel about things going forward. I think, I think when you look at it, um, the pipeline is quite strong at the moment. We have strongest pipelines ever in North America, the UK, and in Europe. North America pipeline is about $5 billion in total and about $3 billion on a weighted basis. That's with a probability greater than 50%. Europe is about $3 billion total and $700 million on a weighted basis. We've had a great start to the year. We've won two contracts um, in excess of $100 million apiece that have yet to be reported. So I think when you look at the, um, you know, the, last year, the new business wins and the momentum in this year, combined with the opportunity in the marketplace, it has us feeling quite good about what lies ahead. Exactly where that lands in terms of a normalized number, I think it's a bit too early to tell. But I think it's, I think it's quite reasonable to expect it will be north of where we've been historically. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Jamie Rollo from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, three, please. But I think the first you may have just answered. On the 2.1 billion of new business wins, um, I'm probably reading too much into it, but versus the H1, 1.1 billion annualized, which was 20% higher. And I think on the May call, you were talking about maybe 200 basis points of faster net gains, and it's, it's 100 now. I, is there a slowdown in the pace of signings in H2? It doesn't sound like it's new comments just then, but keen for any sort of um, commentary there, and also whether you're still seeing sort of discipline amongst your, your main competitors on, uh, on, on, on the tendering process. Secondly, it would be great if you could please give us a sort of steer on the cadence of margins in the year. Um, you know, how, how much stronger will H2 be than H1? And you know, how much of the slowdown on H1 is, is cost inflation versus mobilization if we sort of stick it into those sort of buckets? And then finally, on cash returns, anything to stop you instigating a share buyback this year? Thank you. I think I'm going to hand all, all three of those over to Palmer. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Sure. Um, Jamie, on, on, on your first one, I think you are probably reading a little too much into it. I think when you look at the, um, you know, the sales aspect, it can be lumpy at times. You know, I just referred to a, a couple of new deals. Had they closed in, you know, P12 as opposed to the beginning of the year, um, you know, you wouldn't ask the question at all. So I think it's, uh, it, 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 it's, it doesn't speak to any overall trend you're seeing in the marketplace. <laughs> In terms of cadence of, of margins in the year, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the um, sort of the challenges that are happening on an uh, operational basis. You know, when you look at things like the supply chain disruption, the labor shortage, inflation, um, those are things that we're not sure how long they're going to be around. 
they, they might be around for a while. And I think we've you know, got to be prepared to deal with it for a while. I think the good thing is, is we've got the business model and the track record to do just that. But I think there are a couple things that will have an impact on the margin specifically. One is the, the, the heightened mobilizations that are occurring, the, the reopening of the base business coupled with the, the mobilization of the, uh, the new business wins. Um, a, a, as you know, the, uh, the margin trajectory of contracts increases over the life cycle of the contracts. They come online at, at, at dilutive margins. We absorb the mobilization costs you know, as they occur. So that's having a, a, a waiting because that has not yet normalized yet with the, the heightened activity that's happening. Um, the other, you know, the other thing that's there is simply the, uh, the lag of pricing. So we've got the business model to deal with inflation. We're, we've shown the ability to digest it, whether it's on the, the mitigation side of things or, or, or pricing. Um, but pricing has a lag. Um, we saw a pickup in pricing in the second half of last year. Uh, we're going through um, uh, lots of pricing activity at the moment. And, you know, something that will continue. I think that the combination of the two really points to a heightened margin in the second half. We expect the first quarter, most likely the first half, to be flat-ish with our exit rate of Q4. Um, and we will expect that to accelerate to around 7% by the end of the year and then um, progressing onward toward our historical levels thereafter. You know, with respect to uh, returns to shareholders, um, you know, you'll recognize the capital allocation framework from before. I think over the last uh, 10 years pre-COVID, we returned a little over $8 billion to shareholders. Um, we fully anticipate that uh, and, uh, commencing again, and we think the reinstatement of the ordinary dividend is the first step of that. Jamie, if I might just add to, to a point of detail that you talked about sort of a, a point of higher net new, I think it's, it's slightly above that just on the annualized benefits of the net new we mobilized last year. So with the, the record new business ARO as well, I think that range is probably one to two points. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of James Ainley from City. Please go ahead. Yeah, morning, everybody. Um, some um, sort of related questions on, on the margin outlook, please. Um, when you sort of blend together the sort of labour and food cost inflation that you're seeing, what, what does that imply in terms of an overall kind of cost, percentage cost increase you need to, to offset? Um, and uh, as we then sort of roll forward, I know you're guiding on, on absolute levels of EBIT margin, but how should we think about the sort of drop through on the on the on the revenue rebuild as it continues to, to ramp up um and and i guess the final piece is um on on sort of labor cost inflation um one of your competitors mentioned it's thought, thought they saw some easing in labor cost pressures in in uh, north america in recent weeks is, is that something you've seen too thank you thank you james i think i'll, I'll ha again hand those questions over to palmer just, just one comment to make uh, of course, the, in the guidance we've given today, we have reflected our view of uh, both cost inflation, our pricing, and obviously the drop through on that volume recovery. Um, so all of those factors have been taken into account, but a little bit more color from Palmer. Yeah, it, it, I think your, your, your margin in the inflation pressures, um, it would Currently seeing labor uh, inflation around five percent, uh, food inflation around four percent. Um, we that's what we're experiencing. We think the This is packed to um, you know you know our savings and, and and what we're able to do on the mitigation front. You know, are are we seeing a bit of easing on the you know the labor inflation side of things? Perhaps I think it's a bit early. Um, we've still got a uh, a lot of open positions in North America. I mean we've hired um, about 240,000 employees globally since the trough of the pandemic. Uh, 140,000 in North America. Um, we've got about 35,000 open positions at the moment. 
Um, and we're doing all kinds of things to, to try to fill those positions. Um, so I think it's, it's probably a bit early to tell. We certainly think it will subside over time, um, but exactly you know, what time period you know, remains to be seen. And just in terms of the, the margin progression and the drop through, that really depends on the, you know, the, the, the shape of the, the recovery. Um, the base business coming back online will certainly have a, you know, a higher drop through than the new business um, that's mobilizing. So I think we, you've heard us talk about the significant opportunities we see on both fronts, and that will continue not only for this year, but a bit beyond this year uh, as well. And so it's going gonna, it's gonna to really depend on that, that mix. Um, regardless, as those volumes um, return, you will see the margin progression. That's one of the other reasons why we think the margin progress will be second half weighted. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thanks, James. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from the line of Vicky Stern from Barclays. Please go ahead. Good morning. Um, just firstly, thinking about the incremental returns on the new business, I think you mentioned on the pre-recorded call that you're expecting a roughly similar level of CapEx despite this higher growth rate. Um, can you just help us understand that and, and sort of why is it? Because it's more coming from first-time outsourcing or it's about specific regions or, or segments that that's falling in. Um, secondly, you also mentioned this higher participation rates in B&I coming from a few factors. Just sort of how sustainable do you think that is? Is some of it really about companies sort of really trying to get people back into the office with a bit of an incentive, but that could fade in the future? Um, and just generally where that all leaves you versus sort of 3 to 4 percent potential structural headwind you'd called out for B&I uh, or for the group from B&I in, in the future. And then just finally on Europe, um, really encouraging to see that such a good portion of the winds are coming from Europe. Um, obviously, historically, that's been a slightly more challenging region for you. Just if you can remind us, what, what are the reasons why that's been more of a challenge for you? And I suppose, do you think you're, you're sort of turning the corner in Europe now? Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, Vicky. Um, maybe I'll, I'll have a go at the first one and then uh, and the second, then ask Palmer to, to, to give a, a fresh perspective, I guess, on, on Europe, which I think could be helpful. Um, so first of all, in, in terms of returns on new business, yeah, we, we've said today that you know, our capex, capex to net sale ratio is broadly the same as it's been, and of course, in absolute numbers, that's lower uh, off of a, off of a suppressed top line and for higher new business. So it, it's quite positive. We, we expect some of the capex to come into this financial year as we open that record new business. I think broadly, the, the mix in being more first time has a slightly lower capex. Um, requirements and is more about driving efficiency and quality in, in the early years of a first generation contract. So I think that opportunity in first time outsourcing is particularly uh, positive for us. And you know perhaps also the, 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 the weighting would be uh, towards the healthcare and uh, senior living space as well is, is helpful. I think it's probably worth pointing out finally that um, you know, one of the interesting opportunities around how we invest in, in our clients is to do that through the life of contract, through digital type deployment, uh, through the unattended micro markets, which, you know, will become an investment that we can get returns on um, through the life of a contract, but is attractive to our clients and, you know, is a different way rather than deploying the CapEx up front. Um, so I think at the moment, you know, the, we, we, we'll stick around that three and a half percent level even with the higher growth levels. And uh, I think what's really important is that, you know, the mood you, you'll have heard from us today is it's an exciting market. We should always buy us for growth. We believe we can generate the returns on it. It would be exciting to see higher sustainable levels of growth. And our ability to fund CapEx and use CapEx is one of those one of those tools. Um, on the B&I recovery, yeah, look, I, th I think, you know, inevitably there will be, you know, some short-term measures that are taken. And, you know, uh, maybe some of that will be free food programs. But, but what, what we're also hearing is a, a number of our clients are keen to sustain those programs over time, particularly from a, a well-being standpoint. So I think there is a change going on there. Um, you know, a, again, you know, perhaps higher participation and higher spend will, will be there for a while, but, but it'll certainly help compensate until the volumes come back, as I, as I expect them to do from, you know, the clients that we are talking to. And net-net, I think there's a, a, a broad change in behavior, which will be positive for us within the sector. Um, what does that mean vis-a-vis -vis the three to four percent? I mean, I think we we stand by that now. Uh, I think we feel a little bit less risk on the higher ed side, 
Um, maybe a fraction more here on BNI, but I think only time will tell. Um, but but I don't think it's it's significantly different. And I think we think there's there's loads of opportunity, particularly when we talk about digital and sustainability and our ability to bring offers to clients that you know they can't do themselves and that others are, are, are struggling to build the differentiation around. Um, yeah, when it comes to Europe, I think it's one of the things where you know we're quite excited about the sort of the positive movement that we've seen and the um, I think the momentum going into this year and what we think can carry forward. I think the biggest thing I, I've probably seen in Europe is um, an expansion of the growth mentality. I think that's something that's existed in parts of our business globally, most notably North America, um, but has not been consistent overall. And it's one of the opportunities we see uh, in the, the the rest of the business. And I think you're starting to see that take shape in Europe. And what I'm really talking about there is is a growth mentality throughout the entirety of the organization. It's not just you know the sales team working in isolation to try try to rent, win new business. It's sales. Ops. It's all the departments. It's everyone working together in tandem with that growth mentality. I think once that exists, you really start to see the the, the momentum going forward. You're starting to see that take shape uh, in Europe. Um, we're starting to have a a bit different mentality when it comes to the type of people uh, that we want in certain roles, the types of training that we want to utilize. You're you're starting to see that take root in in, in some of the results already. Um, you've seen where we've had net new business in, in Europe that's two and a half times what it was in fiscal 19. You've heard me talk about the the impressive pipeline that exists right now. Um, there's every reason to think that that can continue going forward. So we're, uh, we're, we're quite positive on Europe. Thanks very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from Richard Clark from Bernstein. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, first one, uh, three of I may, but first one, I guess throughout this pandemic, you, you, you've normally been given quite specific guidance into the, to the next quarter, which you haven't given this time. And I'm just wondering whether there's any specific commentary you give on Q1. You know, it, it, could margins be down from Q4 or, or, or can you think you just keep them around that sort of high fives level? Um, second question, um, looks like you're a little bit more positive on support services. Obviously, you've always done those in uh, in, in DOR and healthcare, but it seems like you're getting a, a little bit more excited about education. So maybe you can just talk about that opportunity. Are you seeing some higher margin opportunities to, to do support services and education? What, what do those look like? Um, and then I think, Palmer, you said that you've won two contracts in uh, 2022, FY22 already, that are over $100 million in revenue. If I look at your slide 27, it looks like you won no contracts in 2021 that are of that kind of size. So can you maybe talk to, are you beginning to see some, some bigger contracts eke away or, or am I kind of misreading that slide or your, or your commentary? Are, they, are, these, are these new wins getting, getting bigger? Well, now, I'll ask Palmer to answer questions one and three and then I'll come back on support services. Yeah, I, th I think Richard on the, uh, the, the, the margin profile, um, we are trying to get away from the quarterly margin progression. I think it was appropriate uh, over the pandemic, but I think at this point where we are in the business, I think we can look more towards a traditional view, uh, and that's what you're seeing. You've heard me say, er, you know, earlier here on the call that we would expect Q1 and um, and and probably the first half to be flattish with um, with the exit rate of of Q4. Um, don't necessarily think that will be lower, um, but we wouldn't expect much margin progression. Um, in that first half and, and, and much more second half weighted. In terms of the, the new business um, wins, those two contracts uh, over 100 million pounds, not dollars, um, to start with. Um, but I, uh, you are right when it, it says that it is bigger than anything we won last year. I would not read too much into that. Um, again, it's, um, it's lumpy. Sales can be lumpy. And I think the biggest thing is to look at, you know, look at the, the longer term trends over time and the sort of the underlying growth profile, the strength of the pipeline, things of that. I think that's probably the better indicators. Um, and, and Richard, on, on the support services, I think we've, we've always said where we've got a point of differentiation and where it's embedded in our model. 
um, then we are, are very minded towards support services. You heard in the presentation today, I talked about high single digit growth throughout the pandemic at, at accretive margins. Now the support service business has been good for us through the pandemic. Um, we particularly favor it in healthcare and DOR. Healthcare, we've always talked about um, uh, the pricing power uh, and the importance of, of hygiene in that environment, and that doesn't change. Um, in DOR, it's always been about, you know, the challenge is actually mobilizing labor into these locations, and you know, that's a point of differentiation for us. I think what's happening in education is we're now seeing the importance of hygiene services within that space. Um, we've got a terrific business in the U.S. We acquired, we acquired a decade ago, which has grown very, very attractively throughout that period of time. Um, so we may be minded to it again where we, we believe it's, it, it, it's critical and integral to the model. And we have a great opportunity to cross out. Um, you know, at the moment, we wouldn't see that in the other sectors, right? So, you know, we're very focused and targeted. You know, where we think we have that point of differentiation. And you know, if it can be growth the creative, then then uh, at that right margin, then we should absolutely pursue it. Very clear. Thanks very much. Thank you. Now, the next question comes from the line of Keen Martin. From Jeffries, please go ahead. Morning, all. Um, I've got uh, three. Yes, yeah, I can. Uh, just first of all, starting with um, some of the big pipeline statistics. Um, but you provided earlier on Palmer. Um, so with that. Suggest if we compare the, the sort of TCV versus sort of weighted and the unweighted numbers. Uh, rate in the UK of about 25 to 30%. Assumed, um, but the US about 60. And I guess within that is, is therefore the place hiring the right people, a bit more of the growth mentality. But we, we are seeing. And you know some improvements in that win rate. I'll, I'll say that um, on the flip side, I don't want to see a win rate this way too high, because that implies that maybe we're not going after enough. So I do think that there's a there's a right balance to play on uh, this there. But certainly you're seeing improvements in the, the sort of the overall mentality and the quality of what we're doing in the UK and Europe. And I think your question on um, you know on the bad debt uh, provision. Uh, Keen is really getting to an overall quality of profits piece. Um, the bad debt uh, provision, yeah, we did establish some some provisions at the beginning of the pandemic, um, which we thought were appropriate for the time. We have not seen sort of that um, that uh, downside really take place. 
on the client side. So that did have some movements um, over this past year. But there were some there were some things on the other side as well. So when you look at an overall quality of profits perspective, it's almost an exact wash for the entire year. So I do think you can look at our underlying operating margin is is really reflective of of the trading of the business. That's probably that's very helpful. Cheers. Thank you. Our next question comes from Stuart Gordon from Berenberg. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, good morning. A um, couple of things that are kind of linked. I think you've spoken historically about the, the flight to quality, particularly from smaller players. Um, is that still happening? And, and could you go into a bit of detail in the sort of mix of the gross wins that you saw this year? And off the back of that, I think because of this flight to quality, you also saw quite a lot of M&A opportunities. Now, if there was nothing significant during 2021, how's the landscape for that looking just now? Thanks. Yeah, um, well, I'll take the first point on, on flight to trust and then that Palmer pick up on M&A. Um, yeah, on the flight to trust, it, it absolutely is still happening. Uh, I, I think we, we probably uh, see that more in the first time outsourcing. Um, it's about uh, you know, self-operated clients who simply struggle with the operational complexities um, that are facing them at the moment, whether it's hygiene, uh, it's the variability of volume, it's the difficulty in sourcing labor. It's all of those challenges we've talked about, which you know we believe is is the driver in that in that shift. Um, if you look at our mix with with, with first time outsourcing going thirty to fifty percent um, on a number which has which has grown, um, you know our wins from uh, our share gains from others remains broadly in line with the historic levels, and and clearly within that, I think we you know we're still seeing some of the factors that I described, but I think this is really about unlocking that first time outsourcing opportunity. And M&A, Palmer? Yeah, I think with respect to, to M&A, it is something that we're, you know, we're still looking at very, um, very keenly. Uh, if you look back to the two years um, pre-COVID, did a number of things um, that we passed on. Um, we've done some smaller deals. We we are looking at a uh, number of things at the moment, um, but it's something that we we do see as part of our overall strategy. We will be selective and disciplined, just like you've you've seen from us historically. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jafar Meftari uh, from BNP Paribas. Please go ahead. Hi, morning everyone. Um, I've, I've got three questions if that's okay. Um, firstly, just on the new business signings, how much of this 2.1 billion that you've signed in 2021 would you say has already been opened in 2021 as part of the 7.2? How much would be truly left to roll out? And, and, and related to that, uh, could you give us some color on the top 10 new wins in North America, just very roughly by sector. Is it road based or are you seeing some of the big pots starting to move? I'm thinking, for example, about uh, self operated university campuses. Some of those you've been going after since 2013. Uh, we know that Aramark has won the first ever contract with Purdue University, for example. Are they going towards outsourcing? Um, and just lastly, you seem to be talking, uh, if I uh, piece together your comments about the Q421 exit rates, so on the revenue side, it would be at or around 100% of pre-COVID revenue. And on the margin side, it would be around 7%. Uh, do you still think there have been structural cost improvements in the business that could allow you to deliver 7% margins with revenue below pre-COVID level? Uh, or, or is the picture now that you pretty much need 100% to, to get to 7%? Yeah, thank you, Jafar. Um, just on the top 10 new business wins, um, uh, broadly, uh, to the f sort of a third of those would have been in the healthcare and, and senior living space, um, a couple within education and a couple each in, in sports and leisure and B&I. So I think most positively, it's broad based across all of the sectors. Um, healthcare is a great sector for us and we've done particularly well there. Um, so I think it goes to the, you know, the, the, the story of we, we, we were delighted with the big wins that we've had previously. That's given us the, the reference sites and reference accounts to accelerate um, the, the first time outsourcing. And I think we've, we're seeing that again. 
Um, uh, I'll, I'll just take the, the Q4 uh, volume and margin points. Um, look, I, I think broadly, we, we know in this business we could get to a margin outcome faster if we if we if we thought it was necessary. Uh, we, we don't want to do that. Um, we want to continue to build this business back to the best it can possibly be. Um, as you've heard Palmer say today, whilst at 90% volume, 80% um, of that is like for like. So there's a lot of new and pricing which comes with different margin attributes. Um, so I think we, you know, we're really pleased with the 7%. We see the ability to get back to pre-COVID margin beyond that, um, with significant progress again in the following uh, following year. Um, and you know, we've learned a lot, right? So you know, it, it's all about how we deploy those additional efficiencies. You know, right now we're in a period of you know incredible reopening and incredible mobilization, which comes with a cost. And you know, we want to do that flawlessly to reward our clients. Uh, with whom the goodwill has been absolutely outstanding throughout the pandemic. I think it's absolutely critical we don't let any of our clients down through this phase. And, and we know that we can we can grow the margins up um, over time beyond that. So it, it's a balance. We would be super excited to really exploit this growth opportunity and uh, and then enjoy the margin thereafter. I think when it comes to the, the, the new business signings and the mobilization, um, roughly 40% or so um, was has been mobilized and captured in fiscal 21. So that would be mobilization and ITT within fiscal 21. The remainder would be a roll into fiscal 22 and, and perhaps a little beyond. I do think it's worth it's worth pointing out that even though you've seen mobilization, um, you may not have seen you know full population. So I think that is a very important factor. You're certainly seeing that play out with some of the. Um, fiscal 19, fiscal 20, uh, new business wins. I think that's the case in fiscal 21. So that will continue to to occur over time. So when you look at the the, the base volume, um, that will return over a you know a, a, a number of years. It won't be all this year. It will extend into to, to 23 certainly. Um, but it is something to, to to factor into the math. Thanks. And you, did you say 40 percent or zero has been mobilized? That's correct. That's correct. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Just as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question on today's call, please press star one on your telephone keypad now, please. Our next question comes from Joe Thomas from HSBC. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. A uh, couple of questions, please. Firstly, uh, you were talking about the ESG and, and decarbonisation. I, I just wonder what that's practically involving in terms of product sourcing, et cetera, and what the margin implications of that might be, um, whether, it, whether it extends the recovery further out. Um, uh, also, uh, just back to the point on transaction values being higher, um, uh, it, it sounds as though that's being driven by some of the, 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 the free food that's being given out in offices uh, at the moment. Is there anything aside from that? I'm just wondering what sort of uh, benefit uh, that uh, technology brings uh, in the long term. And then, uh, sorry, for, for finally, if I may, um, what is the status now with respect to contract renegotiations, things that you were, that, that you previously had on sort of temporary measures? Um, are, you know, have they all been moved off those temporary measures now? Thanks, Joe. Um, just taking the points on transaction values, I, I don't think we should uh, we should read into it that this is about free food. I think it's about a number of factors. I think consumers are spending more. Um, I think the, uh, the the fact that we are cashless creates uh, less price sensitivity. Um, and I think there's a, a mood to enjoy uh, the moment with, uh, with 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 colleagues or friends, whether it's in the office or, or the sports and leisure sector. Um, so I think there's a number of positives that are driving that. Uh, that 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 uplift in transaction values. Um, just on on DSG and decarbonisation, I mean we we address this through a number of measures. Um, of course, we are consolidating the commitments of our suppliers who are also seeking to um, to 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 to, to uh, achieve their own net zero targets. So that that's highly beneficial. Um, a lot of what we're doing is looking at menu uh, choices um, and how we nudge consumers to uh, different choices. Um, some of those means less animal protein and, and potentially less cost, um, as opposed to it being um, more costly sourcing. Um, there may be an element of that in uh, at some point as we look at regenerative agriculture in the longer term. Um, but we also think there's, there's an opportunity for premiumization of an offer where it's a really critical 
um, requirement for our clients and their colleagues. Um, we, we know that a lot of colleagues are want to work for companies with the right values, and this is a very visible show of values that we can help our, our clients with. Um, and if in, in the short term before supply chains uh, really address sort of uh, alternative means, um, that means a little bit of pricing. We think that that is um, something that um, we can work with our clients on. Um, so, so look, I'm not sure it has uh, tremendous margin implications in, in the short term, but we're working through it all. And, and just as an example, when, when we catered COP, we had the, um, you know, the low, low carbon menus with the carbon ratings. We're actually deploying that at 300 sites already in the UK. So it is scaling up uh, at some pace and it's a real point of interest for uh, a lot of our uh, customers. And with respect to the, the contract negotiations, don't don't think of this as you know simple uh, conversations that took place you know at the beginning of COVID and then are yet to take place um, at another point in time, but rather about ongoing dialogue. Um, that's the way that most of these work. It's an ongoing dialogue with the clients about the the offers that they want to have, about their population levels uh, and the like. And so what, you, what you're seeing take place is that a number of these are shifting back and forth uh, over time, but it will be a function of a, of a number of variables. We fully expect, expect that to continue over the course of the year. So it's, it's not like we have any definitive time frame on, on when that will be complete, but these are ongoing conversations. Thank you. Our next question comes from Neil Tyler from Redburn. Please go ahead. Good morning. Um, two follow-up questions from me, please. Firstly, um, Dominic, going back to your point on uh, free food and the offering there, um, can you explain whether that represents a meaningful proportion of the B&I, uh, or particularly the B uh, revenues at the moment, and whether there would be any meaningful margin implication of that proportion growing and essentially where you're billing the customer as opposed to the consumer. That's the first question. And the other one is around um, uh, M&A and just picking up on the comments you made earlier around the, the pipeline. Is it uh, the case that uh, the, um, the, you know, the pipeline of opportunities still exists, but the prices have, have risen, the multiples have risen? Or, um, or you know, that, that, that's perhaps slowing down the level of activity there. Or is, um, uh, you know, is that not not yet reflected uh, in 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 the in the way that you're you're viewing the opportunities there? Thank you. Yeah, that, that. thanks, Neil. Um, just on the the free food points. I mean, the example I would give is within one of our BNI sectors, uh, around 40% of our clients are offering uh, free food programs. Um, so that would be, you know, just to dimensionalise it, sort of 15% of our UK business. So it is significant for that subsector. Obviously, behaviours are different in different sectors, but you know, uh, an interesting development in in BNI. And and broadly, you know, we work with our clients to ensure that we, we're getting a you know a fair margin in line with our expectations, and that it's not punitively costly for them. Um, it's really important that that it, it's fair on both sides, and uh, you know, it, it's encouraging them to, to to take this step, which we think is is a great way of us building, you know, our, our, our position on, on, on site with all of the employees. Um, and then Palmer, just an M&A. Just, just a little more on the, uh, the free food margin impact. Um, those are going to mostly be cost reimbursable type of contracts that are there. Um, those, those clients would really be on the same type of contract structures already uh, pre-COVID. So the, the, the implications on margin really aren't significant. Um, ultimately, it's the client making that decision on what they want to spend. I think the key for us is that we need to operate that with a P&L mentality so that we treat the client's dollars like our dollars. Um, with respect to, to, to M&A, um, we are seeing um, some valuations that are really consistent with what we saw pre, pre-COVID. I think there's a bit of um, sort of mental expectation in a lot of uh, owners minds that um, the business uh, ultimate value really hasn't changed, even though the current trading has. And so when we get into to conversations about you know how to structure deals, it really comes down to the underwriting risk of the recovery uh, and where that lies. 
So we, you know, we're willing to take that on in certain places, certain places where, you know, we want to share that a little bit more. Um, but we're, we, we really aren't seeing any significant, you know, changes in value. I'll tell you, it's, it's not necessarily the value that's kept us from, from doing the deals. It's just a matter of the right deals that really work for us. Got it. Thank you. Very clear. Thank you very much. Our final question comes from the line of Tim Barrett from Numis. Please go ahead. Hi, morning, everyone. Um, I had two things left, please. One, we haven't really talked much about the retention rate. Um, and as you said, it's it, it's a good level. Um, can you talk a bit about non-retained business and any constituents that might be a bit different post-COVID? Um, and then secondly, I just wanted to understand the dividend, the, new, the dividend policy. Um, is the intention to go to 50% payout with one third, two thirds split as you had before? Thanks very much. So I, I think the answer on dividend is, is yes. And then on the retention rate, Tim, you know, we really proved, we're really pleased that it's continued to improve. Um, you know, we're already at very high levels. We've continued to nudge it on. Um, and we would hope to continue to do so. Um, you know, we, we use the pandemic as an opportunity to, you know, lock up a few contracts for longer. Um, we always sought to term out sort of the bigger contracts wherever we can. Um, hopefully that will give us a bit of benefit as we look forward. In terms of, you know, what we've not, 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 not held on to, I don't think, you know, the, the reasons have changed. Um, and, and, you know, we're just very pleased with the, the improving retention rate and really pleased as well that it's across all three regions. I think that's really important for us to, um, to recognize. Is there anything to call out in terms of customers going out of business or, or re retrenching? No, no, do you know, I think it's been one of the uh, positive uh, surprises for us of, of, of how, um, you know, our, our, our client base has, has, has been uh, able to, to withstand um, the, the pandemic. I mean, clearly, you know, I think we, we typically trade, you know, in B&I with, with, with resilient blue chips and, you know, they've been strong through this. So, um, you know, that, has, that hasn't been a feature as it were. I do think. Thanks very much. I do think a, a, you know an interesting anomaly there is you know within the retention rate it does pick up any what we call white losses so that would be um, you know businesses going out of business or being acquired by other businesses um, and we have seen a bit of that uh, this happening um, I think the good thing is with the you know the, the the scale that we have in our clientele we've been net winners um, when it comes to that kind of thing um, it also would pick up. Uh, remote site businesses that would run their, um, you know, life, uh, their natural life. So all of those white losses would be picked up in the um, the retention rate as well. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Okay, and I will hand you back over to your host. So uh, thank you. Just thank you all for joining us today and uh, thanks for the questions and we'll look forward to uh, speaking to you in uh, February. Thank you very much for joining today's call. You may now disconnect your handsets.